Hello and welcome to everyone joining us. This is Lauren from the Museum of Natural and Cultural History, and I'd like to start this evening by recognizing that the museum and the University of Oregon are located on Kalapuya Elihi, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. We recognize and honor all indigenous peoples who continue to call the Willamette Valley home. It's February, which means that it's time for the museum's annual Darwin celebration or conversations to celebrate Charles Darwin's birthday. This week and next, our speakers will explore current extinction trends and weigh the pros and cons of bringing extinct species back to life. This year's talks are made possible with support from the University of Oregon's Wayne Moore Center for Law and Politics. During this evening's program, you can use the Q&A and chat features on Zoom and Facebook to reflect on the talk or add your thoughts, to engage with other viewers, and to ask questions of our speaker. I'll be collecting your questions across both platforms and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Also, we'll be providing a link to a brief survey in the chat box on both Zoom and Facebook. I'd appreciate it if you could take a minute or two to fill it out as your uh, feedback will help us improve future virtual programs. Before we get started, I have a couple of upcoming programs to share with you. As I mentioned, our Darwin Conversations continue next week with Ross McPhee, curator at the American Museum of Natural History, who will join me on Thursday, February 25th for a discussion about the possibilities and pitfalls of de-extinction biology. You can find more information and the link to the Zoom registration page on our website. The following week on Wednesday, March 3rd, our monthly Ideas on Tap program welcomes UO sociologist Claire Herbert for a discussion about Eugene's affordable housing crisis and what it means for the city's students, former prisoners, and others at risk for experiencing homelessness. If you can't join us live for either next week's Darwin Conversation Talk or for Ideas on Tap, we do post recordings of all of our virtual talks to the museum's YouTube page on the following day. So be sure to check out any talks that you've missed. Finally, if you're able, we're asking that you please consider making a secure tax deductible donation of five to $10 at the web address listed on the screen to help keep museum programs like this one accessible to all. That's giving.uoregon.edu slash MNCH gift. Your donation directly supports the museum's educational programming, bringing science and culture adventures to Oregonians of every age and in every corner of the state. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Douglas McCauley. Doug is an associate professor in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology at the University of California, Santa Barbara. His research is directed at understanding the ecology of communities and ecosystems in a rapidly changing world, including quantifying how humans shape patterns of biodiversity. An important aim of his research is to generate results that can be of practical service to, the, to decision makers responsible for shaping the future of our environment. Welcome, Doug. Thank you, Lauren. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen. So we have a few visuals and a bit of data to look at here tonight. Um, I think it's just such an engaging conversation, but before I, I dive into this conversation about de-extinction and extinction, about species and technology and how that all relates to conservation in new, exciting, sometimes a little bit scary and alarming ways, I, I, I would be remiss not to underline the point that you made earlier, Lauren, and just that uh, museums are such an important part of uh, the learning experience, academic experience, getting to know species and places in nature it certainly is a place where I've fallen in love with nature and a place where my kids are falling in love with nature and beginning to understand it more fully and uh, hyper aware of the challenges that uh, museums everywhere are facing now as a result of COVID. So I'm excited to have this conversation with you. Wish we were here together live. Um, and as I say, what is really exciting for me about what we're gonna talk about, about de-extinction is that it connects to so many really interesting um, elements of both biology and conservation biology, but um, also in some ways speaks a lot to our own identity. We'll talk about that in a second, what it means actually to be a species 
what it means to be to be a species like our own that is in control in such a powerful and new and different way for the future of biodiversity on our planet. So there's a lot that's sort of locked in this conversation that uh, um, I think is really uh, deeply fascinating. It may start a little bit further back, and perhaps there's benefit to that. We'll talk. I'll talk with you about. Um, uh, what a species is. We'll touch there briefly. We'll talk about the biology of extinction, which is really my area of expertise. And then we'll go on to talk after we've laid a little bit of that groundwork about some different methods that people are exploring using for um, yeah, for exploring uh, uh, of actually moving forward with the extinction. Then we'll talk a little bit about the pros and the cons, some of the really um, weighty issues that we'll all want to consider as things move forward um, in this really fast moving area. And the value of perhaps starting a little bit further back is, as Lauren mentioned, I'm excited that you have that two bites of this apple, two um, opportunities to dig in from different perspectives um, on the de-extinction issue next week as well. So as I said, um, uh, at some level, this question about um, uh, bringing species back from the dead or preventing species from going dead begs an important question in the first place, which is what in the world is a species? What are we losing? What are we trying to bring back? And I think actually um, there is a lot of complexity that's locked in this subject of what is a species that um, it's not as a simple a question as it may actually at first suggest. So there are many definitions for what a species is and many biologists sort of adhere to this biological species concept, which is the notion that uh, a species is a unique entity and if it can potentially or actually interbreed. Um, and if you don't meet those criteria, you're something different. We're looking at two birds here on the screen. Probably the birders in the audience recognize these and may also recognize some of the very, 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 very subtle features that make them different, but really it's their song that makes them different. This is the Western and the Eastern Meadowlark. For me, who is not a birder, I would see these images, I would see these birds in the field, I would not recognize their distinct species, that they don't interbreed because they look to me morphologically identical, pretty much identical when you see all their outside features. Now, what we don't understand, what you may not understand unless you actually sat with one or both in the field is that they are different because of their behaviors. They have a different song, which then helps them to identify one another along with some of these other more subtle features and prevent them from interbeating, making them two distinct species, despite the fact that they share some space on the planet same kinds of habitat and where they overlap. So when I was first studying biology, there was, um, which was not that terribly long ago, um, there were less good tools than there are today to actually distinguish one species from another, to distinguish these entities, these sort of core, the core currency of life. And it's important again, to sort of get our handle on what that currency is because we're losing some of that currency or trying to regain some of that currency. But the tools and the sophistication um, for being able to identify what a species is, how it's changing, and even as we'll talk about how you might be able to bring some part or all of the species back, of course, are advancing rapidly as our genetic tools, our understanding about the biology and genetics of species are advancing and genetic engineering tools. This is just a slice of my own genome. Um, and of course, there are, there are um, hundreds of thousands, millions of additional base pairs here that uh, become the story of Doug, right? Which talk, uh, in essence, share the code, share the instructions for all things that I am biologically, um, including my hair color, my eye color, and there's some relationship for things that happened in my deep biological history. So I am, for example, about 2% Neanderthal, and that's about 90% more Neanderthal than probably most of you on the call. Um, you can judge me, um, but uh, uh, it shares this genetic code, a lot of really rich information about uh, our own history um, and uh, gives us a sense of how to discriminate exactly what a species is and how it's different from um, a different from another species. And again, is the raw structure that helps us consider how we might use this instruction book to try to rewrite um, some new and some new facets of species and rewrite old lost facets of species when we get into thinking about the extinction. Species change 
over time. But one of the other things that I think is often underappreciated when you think about what a species is, the species concept, is that it's not a binary, um, it's not a binary phenomenon. It's not as if one day a species is born and suddenly you have two, but it's a gradual ph phenomenon with a lot of gray area in between. If you sort of look here at this figure, we're looking at a sort of conceptual diagram for how the genetic identity of a species here may shift over time. Maybe there's something like a river that separated these two different populations. And um, there is some of that genetic diversity that uh, you saw in my genome in this hypothetical species genome. And then when they get split, they diverge and they become more different. But it's a little unclear exactly where does that divergence happen? Is it a new species here? Is it a new species here? When exactly are they different enough to become what we would call two species. Now, it seems perhaps a little esoteric, but perhaps it'll become more germane when we get back to thinking about recovering and preserving species. All right, enough about uh, the biology of what a species is. Again, fundamental to understand this currency if we're gonna start talking about changes in, um, in species over time. Let's talk a little bit about the biology of extinction, if we can. So it's important to know that a a fundamental attribute of life on our planet is extinction. It's natural, if you will. Um, but what changes in really interesting ways in extinction on our planet is the rate of extinction. Um, and we all are probably quite familiar with some periods in Earth's history and deep Earth history when that range changed, when that rate of extinction changed dramatically. So for example, right here, we're looking at an asteroid impact event on our planet, which completely rewrote the rules of biodiversity and set the course for what life is um, today. It happened about 60 million years ago when an asteroid that was about 10 kilometers wide hit the earth um, with a force of about a million atomic bombs, unleashed huge firestones, firestorms, gigantic tidal waves, and of course drove many, many species extinct. That event, we're talking here about uh, something that occurred during the Cretaceous Paleogene um, boundary. Um, that is a hated event in my family because of the love that my children have for dinosaurs. Um, but um, uh, we can see when we look at this deeper um, record here of uh, extinctions and uh, what we're looking at here on the uh, our y-axis is the number of families living at any given time. So we can see these dips in the, um, uh, in the number of families that we have extant or alive on the planet. And those dips, of course, are our um, rapid periods, our accelerating periods of extinction um, that occurred in species loss that occurred. Those are the unusual, what are called mass extinctions. And I said, this isn't our first rodeo. Uh, we'll talk in a minute about what's happening around us now, but what is what you hear and reading the headlines about potentially an emerging mass extinction, not our first rodeo with mass extinctions. We've had many people identify five um, mass extinctions in the past. And again, the key diagnostic feature is the rate. How rapidly did these extinctions occur during these periods? Another key feature, of course, in addition to the rate is the agency. So we talked about asteroids. We've had big periods of volcanism on our planet that have also precipitated these mass extinctions. But this new conversation, the thing that we're seeing in headlines and newspapers and such today, um, this new emerging often called the six mass extinction or the beginning of a six mass extinction has one of those, well, has two very unique features. One of course is this consistent unique feature was shared with other mass extinctions related to rate. So um, here we're looking at uh, rates of um, extinction for some common um, vertebrates on our planet. These are terrestrial invertebrates. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's going on underwater, at least in the oceans in a moment. But uh, we see an uptick and a rapid uptick around the 1700s, 1800s for common, important, ecologically important, economically important uh, species all around us like mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles. So there is that shared characteristic with these past extinctions which is this rapid uptick in rate of extinction. But the thing that's unique, of course, and I'm saying the obvious here about this new mass extinction is the agency. So this is not caused by an asteroid and not caused by a period of volcanism. In fact, it is caused by us, of course, and we are in fact it, the new asteroid, which is really quite remarkable that one species, and of course remarkable in the entire history of life on our planet, that one species would have the ecological 
power and prowess that drive so many other species extinct at such fast rates. So this is something novel um, uh, and, uh, and something important, of course, for us to pay attention to. Let me talk about um, the oceans for a moment. As I suggested, those first patterns that we just looked at here are all from land. And uh, you're gonna have to geek out with me for a minute because I am largely an ocean scientist. So I think a lot about what's happening in the oceans in terms of extinction. So let's ask this question here on the title, which is, is the sixth mass extinction, those patterns that we looked at just a moment ago, are those repeating themselves also underwater? And the whole point here is that we get a sense of how urgent the situation is with the extinction, thus how important it is, or perhaps isn't, to think picking up these new tools for extinction. Now, I'll give away the ending, which is this is a grave, grave situation with extinction. But let's go back to this question. What's going on under the water? So we're moving back a bit in time. We were just looking at some extinction records that were um, out a couple hundred years ago. We're going to step back here in this graph. Uh, tens of thousands of years ago. And we're looking a little bit at a timeline of extinction on our planet. Now, interestingly, the extinction timeline is coupled to important events in our own um, species timeline. Again, humans as the agent um, for this new kind of mass extinction that our planet is seeing. And what I mean is that uh, when we arrive to new places on the planet, is when we see these spikes in extinction. Our green bars here are our um, increases in extinction that you're seeing, number of extinctions you see occur in any given period. So we arrived to Australia, we saw a peak in extinction uh, concurrent with our time of arrival. We arrived in the Americas, we saw uh, a, another spike in extinctions then. Last 500 years, which is this gigantic bar, this is the makings, the sort of raw ingredients for what we were talking about a moment ago, This um, the beginnings, what many people believe is a six mass extinction on land. And that's about the time that we were everywhere, that there was really no space left on the terrestrial planet that humans had not yet arrived and began doing our ecological thing. So this question about oceans, let's try to answer that using this same graph. When I drop in um, extinction patterns for animals in the sea, interestingly, um, you see silence all the way across this record until you get the last 500 years, in which case you see the first blip in blue. I'm plotting our extinctions for oceans. First blip of uh, on the radar screen of extinction in the sea. When you add all those up, extinctions from the um, last uh, um, 500 years, that last little section here um, that we saw on the chart, um, you can get a sense of the difference in terms of um, uh, of total amount, and we'll look at, at a moment at rate of extinctions in these two gigantic domains of life uh, on our terrestrial ecosystems and in, in our oceans. If you actually tally up the body count, if you will, of extinction um, on land, you have about 500, well, 500 plus now extinctions that occurred on land and about 15 extinctions that occurred during roughly the same period, last 500 years in our oceans. You're looking here as we slowly screen through a couple of the images of the um, what sometimes call the oceans 15, the 15-ish 15 extinctions that have occurred in our seas. Okay, I wanna um, take on another really important subject, one that's near and dear to the work that I, own, that I, I do in my own lab, which is about, as Lauren mentioned, understanding the consequences of extinctions or putting species into context in ecological systems. So, so far, we've got a sense of what a species is, which is good common ground to start on. We've got a sense of what's going around, going on around us. The first sense, I'd like to return a little bit more to dive in a few steps deeper into extinction biology, just so we have a full and mature sense of um, this um, six mass extinction, this, this sense of rapid acceleration that we're seeing in data around us here and now on the planet. I want to pause in the middle here um, about our story of the biology of extinction to talk about the significance, the ecological significance of extinction. So here's a species, a sea otter that's not yet extinct, it's endangered. Um, and we can at least say the obvious thing out loud, which is this is one damn cute species. And um, I think if there's one thing we can agree on, it's probably that. So um, Importantly, though, as ecologists, 
I think it's allowable to admit the uh, cuteness of our study species, but uh, what really fascinates, intrigues, and enthralls us is the complexity of putting a species cute or not into the complexity that is the surrounding food web or the surrounding um, ecology that wraps its way around any given species in any system you study. Probably many of you know the story of the sea otter, which is a story of complexity. Sea otters, if they were to be driven extinct, move from endangered to extinct on our planet, not only would we lose a pretty fuzzy face from the portfolio of biodiversity on our planet, we would lose an important set of interactions. And, and that's honestly what keeps me up most at night about extinction. I identify with the charisma of species and life on the planet and my own life is richer because we have such diversity of species on our planet. But what worries me most and perhaps selfishly from a human perspective is what the ecological or functional significance is of losing these species. Here's just a portrait. Sierras are immensely well studied, which is a good thing. It gives us a little bit of a poster child, poster child insight to the significance of the loss of species. Sea otters, when we lose them, we not only, as I say, lose a species, we lose function. Sea otters are connected as predators to sea urchins and to kelp. Um, uh, they're connected as consumers over to a host of different inver invertebrates from sea stars to invertebrates to fish. Their loss precipitates cascading change. So when they go as voracious fuzzy cute predators, you see explosions of sea otters, sea urchins in certain systems, which then mow down kelp forests, which then affect all of these species that we have here on the list here are these species interact and are influenced by having sea otters present in a system. And in fact, you also have functional influences that reach all the way out to affect carbon sequestration in systems. And when sea otters are present or absent in systems, it even affects us, it affects um, fisheries that interact with these kelp forest ecosystems as well. So I suppose my point here is that uh, this is serious business losing species. It's a bit like for those of you, most of you, dare say all of you that are sort of accustomed to think about uh, um, ecological systems and think about system complexity these days. Um, it's much more like when we lose a species, like when you lose a CEO from a company or when you took a, if you were to take a circuit board and delete a circuit, there are cascading consequences when that happens. Um, and it's sometimes difficult to predict exactly what those cascading consequences may be. They may be simple or they could be complex and far reaching as they are in the case of the sea otter. Sea otter turns out to be a really important CEO in its own um, ecosystem uh, underwater. So with that in mind, let's just jump back into the story about the biology of extinction. We know it's a grave matter. We know that there are functional consequences. We know some of those functional consequences can map back onto us. But a few more thoughts on rate and urgency, and as that sets the stage for us thinking about the urgency um, and the importance of trying out new tools to try to erase or walk back some of these patterns. So here I am plotting extinction um, on land and in the oceans. Again, we're just seeing on, in a different way the patterns that I showed you before. We see this uh, um, much larger um, number of extinctions. And you can see in the slope, the increase in rate of extinctions that occurred um, already on land. And you see that it's relatively good news in the oceans. Now, not to sort of pull the rug out of any of you, um, but uh, I'm from under any of you, but um, one of the things when I first saw this was good news. And I spent some time um, looking harder at not just where the extinction patterns are now, but trying to do um, some forecasting where extinction might go in the oceans. And there are lots of ways to do that and subject maybe for another conversation. But when you look at um, different projections that you can make by looking at uh, levels of endangerment in the ocean, species that are themselves sitting on the brink of extinction and you create forecast models that then make them go extinct in different scenarios, it's very easy it's unfortunately easy to see patterns very soon in the near future getting as bad in the ocean as they are on land. Um, so uh, our situation is serious. And again, to just add a little bit to this urgency, I wanna talk for a second about mechanism. So many things involved, as you can imagine, and causative agents for driving species extinct in land or sea. But um, one of the things that I think is really intriguing to me is what changed here on land about this time, again, the, in the 17 or 1800s, 
what changed that caused this flat line of extinction to become a angled line to see extinctions begin to accelerate on land? Well, lots of things happened, but one of the things that happened was that on land, this is the period of the industrial revolution. You know, it was a period of great change in humanity in society, a period of great change in our relationship with how uh, our species was using the planet we were drawing from the planet, lots of good that came from the Industrial Revolution, lots of really wonderful products and medicine and innovations that helped us um, move forward in a healthier and a more prosperous way. But we also invented a bunch of things on those, um, in those factories that uh, we perhaps didn't want. We invented air pollution and water pollution. This is a river outside of uh, um, where my mother grew up, which caught fire not once, but 13 times um, as a result of pollution coming out of some of the factories. So when we began this, this industrial revolution on land, I would argue that that was a game changer for extinction. We really changed our relationship with the environment and our resource needs and our dependencies um, from, uh, the, the, uh, from our natural world, which I think was one of the major changes which precipitated this dramatic increase in extinction on land. And I throw that out there as a mechanism more with the interest of looking forward as we look forward and think about some of these brave new tools, which is to say that uh, I see when I look at patterns of change in the other you know, two thirds of the planet in the oceans, because I spend so much time thinking about change out there, I see bit by bit um, things happening with human industry and the extension of the human footprint into our oceans that look very reminiscent for expansion, the same kinds of patterns of expansion for human industry that we saw on land, which is to say, it seems when you look out to see these days, at least in um, the data for how we're uh, interacting with the oceans, that we are perhaps beginning with baby steps towards an industrial revolution in the oceans, which is important because that means that things may be getting bad fast. Um, in both land and sea. And for those of you that are freshwater biologists um, or freshwater interested naturalists, or um, the patterns are just as bad. In fact, in, in many measures worse um, in freshwater ecosystems than they are in land or sea. So um, we have a concept of species. We have a sense of uh, the um, rate and the magnitude, the urgency of what's changing in the six mass extinction that seems to be building around us. We have a sense of the gravity of this situation in terms of what it actually means for us and planet if we're losing more of these species for the planet. So what do we do about it? Well, this picture here is meant to give you a sense of the classic tools that we pulled together, a whole diverse um, set of conservation bio biology interventions and science-based interventions for trying to uh, prevent species from going extinct and to um, bring species back from the brink. And these are classic tools that all of you are aware of, things like uh, addressing deforestation, breeding programs for endangered species, um, uh, enforcement of protected areas. Um, a list goes on and on. Textbooks written, written about the playbooks for classical tools, if you will, to try to avoid species extinction. And um, I think um, this is where I'd like to sort of jump off from thinking about um, with it, it, the foundation laid about the seriousness of this issue. I want to talk a little bit about this new set of tools, a brand new and equally diverse toolkit that uh, is coming at us and is, is coming online that allows us to think about some exciting, um, and as I say, um, uh, exciting and, and also complex new tools that we'll be adding to our portfolio of tools for trying to do conservation. So let's talk a little bit about some of those methods. Now, I don't want to spend um, or dive too deep in these methods. I think it's really useful, though, both from a, a biological standpoint um, um, and uh, from a functional standpoint to actually understand a little bit about the mechanism and the diversity of different kinds of de-extinction tools that are out there. But um, um, uh, we'll just, we'll touch on them at a very high level. I wanna to touch on a couple different methods that sit in this umbrella of new tools that people would classify as de-extinction tools. The first is sort of the reversal of a process that helped us make a whole bunch of new kinds of animals on the planet. And that's just selective breeding, right? So this first class of tools is called backbreeding, where essentially you might take a set of species that have some ancestral trait from a now extinct species, and then selectively try to combine them or um, mate them and breed them such that you're recreating bit by bit 
some element um, as much as you can with fidelity of that now extinct species. Take the case of the orc, right? So orc is a, um, a now extinct um, uh, ancestor species of the modern cow, once ranged across um, a good section of Europe. Remember I mentioned that when I actually look at my own genome sequence that I can look back um, at uh, genetic contributions from Neanderthals, that I'm 2% Neanderthal. Not only do I, am I able to know what percent of, Neanderth of, of my own genome do I share with Neanderthals, but I can also actually go to the trait level and figure out what are the specific traits that are Neanderthal-like or have uh, relation or origin to Neanderthals in my own genome. You can do that with the auric too. People are doing with that or with the auric. You look, um, so you're not just backbreeding, but you're backbreeding with genetic insight. You look at a series of modern cattle. You look for cattle that have some genetic origin or some genetic signal of these ancient orcs. And not only do you look for what percent it is, you look for what those traits are. Is it something to do with the tail, the horns, their diet, their behavior? And then you can be even more effective, not just trying to add up the raw percentage of auric, but trying essentially to build back in the genetic puzzle pieces that may add up to something that's more auric-like. As you can imagine, it's um, hard, you might say impossible to recombine all of these puzzle pieces together to breeding alone to create an aura, but perhaps, and people are trying, you can get closer to auric-ness biologically by trying to combine some of those traits, again, by using um, genetic sequencing to give you a little bit of, of good insight into how to drive that breeding process. Let's jump to another technique of de-extinction as we kind of survey the landscape of tools that are out there in this new space of conservation genetics, de-extinction tools. Cloning. So everyone's probably heard of cloning in the context of humans. Um, effectively, the tools are just about the same when it comes to thinking about applying cloning to species recovery. Um, so the mechanics of the process is sort of uh, outlined here. You, well, let's do outline it in the case in, in, through the story um, of the ibex, an ibex, a particular species of ibex that went extinct in Spain. Driven extinct by hunting, there's one last individual left. Um, unfortunately, I, 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 there's some sense of irony in this, I suppose, but uh, a grand, great regal species, the last member of its species died with a tree branch falling on top of it and killing it. It died in about the 2000s. Anyway, not so very long ago, so you did have access to living tissue or, um, uh, or live uh, uh, fresh tissue from this um, ibex. You're able to actually go into that skin tissue, extract, extract a nucleus, well, you to get a, a living skin cell, then you are able to go through, then um, with that living skin cell, you have all of the DNA of that um, now extinct ibex. You need a home to stick that uh, DNA. And the home comes in the form of an egg that's extracted from a near relative, a donor egg. And the near relative, of course, of the ibex would be a, a domestic a goat. So you get an egg from a domestic goat and you remove the DNA, the nucleus from that egg. So you have an, a, a, a empty egg cell. You fuse that um, using electricity um, to the skin cell that allows it to absorb the genetic material from the extinct ibex. And so now suddenly you have an egg that has genetic material from that ibex. It's a complete copy. Remember cloning actually gives you an identic, identical genetic copy of whatever your um, uh, one individual was that is using, that is your source for that DNA. You then have this um, embryo and it successfully begins to divide. You can place it back into a surrogate. Um, in this case, again, you're looking for a related species, um, a goat. And um, if it can successfully bring that embryo to term, then you can clone and bring back a clone of that uh, ibex that was killed by a tree branch. So scientists um, made a, an attempt at this. They got a, quite a number of embryos um, that uh, were actually dividing. They implanted seven those into, or they implanted those into goats. Um, and uh, in the seven goats that they implanted those embryos, one actually became pregnant and gave birth um, to a clone of the ibex. Unfortunately, um, the process of cloning is a challenge, um, a biological challenge, um, to say nothing of the ethics, which we can perhaps touch on in, in the Q&A. But the ibex died, the baby ibex died, this clone of the um, parent ibex, as often is the case in some of these cloning experiments, when they dissected the, the uh, ibex, many of the organ systems were intact, 
but it had um, some major um, uh, challenges with its respiratory system. So that's cloning. Two methods thus far, let's pick up just a couple more and then we can dive into thinking about taking some of these de-extinction methods out in the field. I think it's just really useful for us to have a sense of what are all these tools that are in this weird new and um, potentially exciting toolkit. Um, so uh, the second and perhaps the area where most scientists that are thinking about the extinction are spending a lot of thought time and spending a lot of the time in the lab relates to genetic engineering. Um, so in this process, what you do is you first must have um, a sequence, um, preferably the entire genome of an extinct species. Now this creates a time barrier for how far back you can actually get involved, at least for now and probably forever. Um, and with it, uh, de extinction science or de extinction conservation, you must have that genome. And of course, as DNA degrades, you have a, a, a time horizon of about a million, perhaps a little bit longer um, uh, years before you can actually extract um, viable DNA and sequence it, um, especially out to the entire genome for a species. So, probably some of you saw in the news yesterday a really exciting event where scientists actually. Uh, about doubled the time that they were able to move back in history, it went back all the way to about a million years for um, extracting and sequencing the genome of a woolly mammoth. Pretty transformative and really hard um, um, step uh, in terms of paleogenetics. Anyway, you've got that sequence for this extinct species, for this woolly mammoth, for example. Then you find another living um, uh, representative of the same family, like the Asian elephant. And Asian elephants and, and uh, woolly mammoths are really quite uh, genetically similar. 99 plus percent uh, overlap in their genome sequences. Then you use new genetic engineering techniques. Probably a lot of you have heard of CRISPR out there, CRISPR-Cas9, a new technique um, that allows you actually to go in and edit out sort of like editing a Word doc, changing the, um, deleting some things, adding a few other things, changing the instruction books um, of a genome. You go through and you um, take the framework of a very genetically similar species, again, Asian elephant being that framework, and then use insight from your woolly mammoth instruction book, that genome, and edit in things into the Asian elephant genome, which are more woolly mammoth-like. Maybe you edit in a sequence that makes an Asian elephant more hairy or more cold resistant. And you create an embryo, just as we we're talking about before in the case of cloning, and you either have to implant that into a living surrogate, into a female Asian elephant, or you have to figure out some way to um, develop it in the lab in some type of artificial womb and bring that species back to life. More to say on the matter, but that's a third flavor of kinds of de-extinction. The last kind of de-extinction, at least that I'll talk about, and you know, I have to say again, there are lots of variations under these themes is um, essentially, IVF for wildlife. Now, in the case of, uh, of using some of these IVF techniques for anybody you know, who is familiar with how we apply this science and how rapidly and sophisticated this science has advanced, advanced in our own species for thinking about helping parents have kids, very similar, um, almost identical science research and techniques, but you apply them to wildlife. Um, and in the case of the extinction, you're applying them to species that are on the brink or have just gone um, extinct. Probably the classic case, and a really interesting case study of using some of these um, assisted reproduction techniques for um, helping with conservation is the case of the northern rhino, rhino, white rhino. The northern white rhino is a subspecies of rhinoceros um, that uh, used to number in the thousands across to, um, um, its home range and is room driven back to a very, very small number of individuals. In fact, there are two living members of the northern white rhino that are alive today. They're both females. Um, there were two males um, that uh, lived in association with these females. Um, unfortunately, they could not breed, but before the males died, they actually collected sperm from those males. They've now collected eggs from the females. And they're doing what you do for um, IVF um, in humans with these rhinos. You essentially are making test tube baby rhinos using very similar techniques, similar in some ways, different in other ways. This image just shows a, 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 a brave and thoughtful veterinarian um, working or getting poised to go and remove some eggs from one of these female northern right, right rhinos. Um, you can imagine um, there is a lot that maps on from our science of IVF 
when it comes to thinking about human species. But do remember, humans are the best studied species on our planet. So taking these techniques and these methods and the science into something like a, a rhinoceros is a whole different ballgame and very challenging. But the scientists were able to remove eggs and in the laboratory to actually combine eggs and sperm, create some viable embryos that have actually um, begun to grow in the lab. The next challenge is to actually take those embryos that are dividing and implant them into a surrogate mom, as we were talking about before with with uh, instances of cloning or genetic engineering. In this case, the two um, still living northern right winos um, are too old to, or actually have some health complications that prevent them from getting pregnant. So the only choice is to take that living embryo, that test tube baby northern white right rhino and implant that into a southern white rhino, a related subspecies. So a handful of different techniques that uh, people are exploring to be able to move forward in um, de-extinction science. Um, and I should say that uh, it is not often or rarely when people are talking about using these tools, a case of just using one. Um, you can mix and match them um, uh, in myriad different ways. Um, take the case of the uh, black-footed ferret, an endangered species here in the United States. People are trying to apply some of these IVF techniques. People have been trying to actually do some gene editing um, to help or have been considering gene editing to help the species um, from survival. One of the major drivers of extinction, original drivers of extinction for this ferret species was uh, um, encounters with plague. And so there are some thought that you could go through and actually edit in resistance to the plague to some of these populations. Um, and there are those that are thinking about potentially cloning um, or using clone, cloning-like techniques because there are, of course, living cell lines for the ferret. It's not yet dead. So um, this is probably a good point for us to reflect a little bit or transition a little bit to think about just because we can, should we? And if we should, um, what are the rules that we might apply? As I said, there's a whole layer, as we talked about, uh, about um, having the ecological power to drive species extinct is brand new. Having some of the intellectual power to potentially recover species is brand new, which op opens a whole set of questions about, should we essentially play God amongst the ecosystems that we play God in different ways by destroying? Do we now use these tools to recover? Um, let's actually look at this and I will leave aside some of the ethical questions, perhaps for someone better trained and more expert in, in ethics. And I wanna examine some of these questions from a very practical perspective, from a conservation perspective. And somebody like myself who has been looking at tools like these, how are you use classical tools to bring species back from the, dent, from, the, from the brink of death, prevent species from going extinct? What does a classical conservation biologist think of or how should they be thinking of um, how to embrace some of these tools? Well, there's a diversity of opinions, as you can imagine out there. This is just a sample, one um, quite colorful quote from a conservation biologist um, that, uh, as you can see, is not a fan of de-extinction, calls these tools molecular gimmickry, says that they're providing a uns unscrupulous developers, providing the people that are driving species extinct with um, excuses that they can continue to do what they will do because they essentially are getting cover for their actions because people are promising we can bring species back from the dead. Well, we get something we want to engage, but let's look at a, a few practical complications for trying to use tools from extinction. The first is a practical issue associated with finances. So I think anyone who's involved in conservation or thinks about nature and its future knows that it's expensive um, to just do plain conservation, extremely expensive to bring species, to do species conservation, um, and more expensive the more endangered species get, as cases get more and more complex. Well, a set of economists um, and conservation biologists looked at uh, an issue uh, uh, associated with uh, um, funds not being, um, conservation funds not being enough, and also potentially um, uh, uh, displacing one another. If you spend a dollar on de-extinction, are you taking that dollar away from doing um, classical conservation? They sliced and diced the, diced the uh, economics a, a bunch of different ways, but uh, in one of the combinations found that if you actually took the money you'd invest in de-extinction, instead invest it in doing classic um, biodiversity conservation, the tools we were thinking about before in that old school toolbook for conservation, you would actually get uh, at the end of the day, much more um, bang for your buck in terms of species conservation. There's an important assumption here, which is maybe something we can engage if you wish um, in questions about uh, whether those um, are actually uh, 
um, fungible commodities? Or is it a new donor that's coming to the table to fund due extinction? Or are you actually taking the interest from a donor that would otherwise maybe be investing in rearing baby pandas um, and instead um, distracting them or driving their attention to the extinction science? All right, a couple other, this is me wearing my um, ecologist hat, um, very um, pragmatic ecological questions about um, challenges associated with the extinction or challenges that you'd have to address if you wanted to overcome, that you'd have to address and overcome if you wanted to be successful from a conservation biologist standpoint for using these tools at the extinction. The first thing is that uh, it, you have extinction of species, but things don't stay static. You also have extinction of species around them and extinction of context. Remember our sea otter, right? That's one species that's embedded in this matrix of species this web or network of species, but uh, in intervening tens, hundreds, or thousands of years, you can imagine um, all of these things that the sea otter depended on, and the sea otter uh, depended on the sea otter, perhaps themselves have changed from some of the same drivers that may have driven the sea otter extinct. And so um, the image here that I'm showing here, when we think about ecological context and extinction of habitats and extinction of context is a picture of, um, of uh, the chestnut tree in the Eastern United States. There's a big de-extinction effort underway, really interesting charismatic effort at trying to recover the passenger pigeon. And passenger pigeons, for those that uh, of you who know the passenger pigeon, or at least know the story, because it is extinct now, used to be a bird that numbered in the billions um, in the United States. When they flew overhead, people would talk about the sky turning black from these species. Now they're wholly extinct, gone. Um, they depended for forage on um, these chestnut forests. Um, and in the years after they have gone extinct, the chestnut itself, as many of you know, has gone from being a tree that numbered in the billions to a tree that now hundreds, numbers in the hundreds because of uh, chestwood, chestnut blight um, on, in the Eastern US. So a lot of uncertain questions about what if you were to bring a passenger pigeon back without its forest, how would it survive? An important set of considerations to think about as you apply or considering the applying these tools about um, species as ecosystems. We're all familiar with the thought of the microbiome, which is this complex living system of microbes and viruses that uh, live in our mouth, live in our gut, live on our skin. And in fact, in really um, interesting and, and more sophisticated ways, we're beginning to understand the role that they play in keeping us healthy, driving away and function driving away infection and doing things like helping us function, helping us digest our food. We may be able to bring a species back, but we can't go to the millions of uh, bacteria, fungi, parasites, viruses that make up our microbiome or bio microbiome of these extinct species and bring them back as well. How would a species brought back without its ecosystem, its microbiome ecosystem fare? Then of course, there's the extinction of behavior. Um, so much of what a species is, is learned um, from conspecifics, learned by its relatives. Think of the classic case of the elephant, how um, so much of its social biology, how to be an elephant, how to behave, where to travel, what to eat. A lot of that is pre-programmed, but a lot of that is learned. Um, and without conspecifics around, if you reach back far in time and bringing back a single mammoth, you don't recover any of that behavior. And then a last point of complexity for us to grapple with and think about is that uh, sometimes when we drive species extinct, even if we could bring them back, we have to think about what is the thing that drove them extinct in the first place still alive and around. If they were driven extinct by a virus, by an invasive species like a rat, and are, is that driver gone such that we can safely restore this species into its place and actually make a real conservation success? So in some of our writing and research on how would you apply these new tools effectively, we identified three basic rules to consider. If you're going to apply some of these techniques, then we suggest you think first about selecting species that are functionally important. In my work in Africa um, and work also in coral reefs, I've found that something probably many of you already intuitively know that not all species are created equal. You can have um, mice and elephants in African savanna that uh, are herbivores, but uh, they are not functionally unique. Elephants are functionally unique, different from um, uh, uh, any number of mice. You cannot add up a thousand mice and equal the power of an elephant to knock over a tree and re-engineer the heterogeneity um, and even the carbon cycling across the savanna. So if we're gonna choose something, if we really wanna make a difference for that function, remember my concern that keeps me up at night is about restoring those jobs that are lost in these ecosystems. We probably wanna choose a species that's functionally unique. Second, oops, dear. 
Um, uh, second, we need to think about abundance. So um, we really need to think about uh, if we're bringing a species back in the lab, um, uh, can we, if we're gonna bring it back into the field, bring it back in um, numbers that uh, are actually ecologically meaningful. It doesn't do us any, any good to bring a species back um, uh, if you can't, if you have one mammoth, it's not going to recreate the jobs that, that mammoth did. It won't actually potentially even recreate any of the behaviors of that mammoth. So if you actually wanna introduce these jobs back in, you have to think about the context about whether you could actually release them, whether you could actually restore them or conserve them to historically abundant numbers. And the last thing, a guideline, is thinking about species and, and choosing targets based on species that uh, are either very recent in terms of their extinction or are not yet extinct at all. And that's this question about the chestnut tree or this um, question about the evolving loss or cascading effects over time of the sea otter is that uh, if you choose a species that has not yet gone extinct or has gone very recently extinct, the chance that it's lost some of its context, its ecological context, and it's hard to restore it back into place um, is probably a bit lower. We couldn't expect, for example, to um, remanufacture a, um, a piece from a 1910 um, uh, Model T Ford and stick it into a Tesla and make it work. Well, we can't expect to reach too far. We might expect we reach too far back in time and recover an extinct species, try to plop it into a modern ecosystem. We might have the same kinds of results. Let me just jump forward here to um, uh, when we actually apply those rules and we scan the landscape for candidate species, I have to say we come up with some pretty boring things. The, uh, uh, the, the labs and some of the scientists that are working on de-extinction targets are working on sexy creatures like the passenger pigeon, like the mammoth. Um, and when you actually apply these conservation, this conservation rubric, you get uh, less sexy things. The, our poster child for a really good candidate for de-extinction, de -extinction, for example, is the lesser stick rat. And most people sort of roll their eyes at the idea of spending effort and money restoring a lesser stick rat, but it went extinct just a, little, a short amount of time ago, a handful of years ago. It's an Australian species from the outback of Australia. It's functionally important and it builds these large nests made out of sticks, as the name suggests, which are aggregators, apartment complexes for a lot of life in the deserts. Um, and uh, it would be easy in the deserts to bring them back into the same numbers that they once existed, but it's hard to get, uh, say, donors excited about the lesser stick nest rat. Easy for a geeky biologist to get excited about that as a good target. Let me, by way of conclusion, um, much of the thinking and the processing about should we do this, I'm gonna leave um, in your hands. I wanna really get you armed with good science and a few of these questions and complexities so you know, engage these tools as they um, surface and they themselves become more prominent in, in conversations about conservation. But I, I would say that there is a real hazard. There is something really exciting and there's a real hazard. The one thing we don't wanna do is um, simply create novelties. We don't wanna create parks or zoos where we've had, um, where we bring back just something to gawk at like a mammoth. We have a very grave thing happening around us on our planet, a, a mass extinction event which um, is very, very serious. And we can't apply these high intellect tools, smart people and limiting funding to make um, simply zoos with novelties. And the last thing I'll say, um, again, perhaps we can process a little bit of this together in the Q&A is, um, well, a few things. The first is and just using this image of the Northern white rhino. I had the privilege of meeting one of the male white rhinos before it died, an individual called Sedan. And I can't impress upon you just how special that experience is. You know, you look at a Northern white rhino and for any of you who've been in the African savanna, it looks as if some powerful hand had gone to one of those granitic outcrops, rocky outcrops there, and it carved out this living sculpture that's old and powerful and wise and, and, and meaningful. And to know that we're at the brink of losing a species like that, you know, it's, it's a real sense of loss that I think we need to be left with, which I think underscores the importance of conservation and the importance of thinking creatively. Um, but it also, I think, highlights a few other important takeaways. One, and these are the last thoughts I'll leave you with, is that um, the opportunity and the excitement around these tools doesn't let us off the hook in any way, any way for the things that we've done to some of these species and our responsibility for undoing some of that challenge. 
that even though some of these tools that we're developing the labs are really exciting and shiny and exciting uh, and and um, and promising and, and in many cases um, pushing the envelope for genetic um, uh, for both the application of genetic engineering into animal sciences and um, conservation sciences we can't let our um, fascination with some of these shiny new tools distract us from the really important task of slowing down this fast moving mass extinction, which is building around us. Um, I'd say as my final takeaway point, it's sometimes um, a sense that uh, we can invent an easy way out of this problem. Um, and I think these tools have promise. I think they deserve exploration, but they can't distract from the very, very important and much harder tasks of taking on the very complex issues that in many cases have driven these species extinct in the first place thinking about the complex ecological and social drivers behind poaching, thinking about the drivers of deforestation, trying to get ourselves um, to combat what will be a brand new wave of extinctions that are driven by climate change and slowing and stopping climate change. Um, unless we deal with these big issues, there are no unfortunate solutions to those to be found in labs. The test tube rhinos that we manufacture are GMO ferrets will not have a safe place to survive on our planet. So as I say, I'm going to cheat you of giving you answers of how to process this, but hopefully a, a little bit of food for thought of how to engage this complex new space that we're heading into as conservation biologists. Love to field any questions that you have. And I think we have a few minutes to do that. Thank you so much, Doug, that was excellent. Um, I know it can be a little weird in the virtual world. So let's just pretend like we have a very large audience here who's all applauding for you. Um, but since this is our Darwin Conversations, we did have one question come in that I wanna kick off and get us started with. Um, it's someone on Facebook asking, was Darwin aware of mass extinctions? And what would he think of de-extinction? Channeling my inner Darwin. Uh... <laughs> Well, no, I, it's, he's aware of many of the things that we talked about, of course, was not aware of genetics, but was aware of the power of breeding to try to um, drive and shape species and gave us this concept of species and change in such a powerful way. And of course, the concept of evolution. Uh, as far as I'm aware, um, there's nothing in his writing that speaks about extinction. Now, I'm not a scholar of Darwin, so this, uh, this question will give me a good charge to sort of go back and see if he had anything to say about um, some of these phenomena. And, and recall too that um, at the time he was writing, you know, we were seeing baby steps forward on land for the acceleration of extinctions, but uh, we had not yet seen this really, unfortunately, re reach the pace that we're seeing around us today. So it's quite possible that uh, you could be as astute a naturalist as Darwin was and, and not have this register. Um, of course, he was you know, thinking about some pretty important concepts in his own right too. What he would think about the extinction, gosh, um, um, I, I'm not sure I could hazard a, a guess. I mean, I think that um, um, the thing that has always impressed me about uh, Darwin's writing is that he's such a good naturalist. I think he looks out at some of these tangled bank systems, um, sees their complexity, appreciates their complexity, um, and understands them through their history. So I might think him first to be, or predict him first to be a bit of a traditionalist when it comes to these tools, but uh, you may never know. Perfect. Uh, since I threw you a curveball there with that one, I'll try and switch back to something that might be a little bit more in your wheelhouse. Um, someone is wondering whether there are aquatic candidate species for de-extinction or conservation using de-extinction tools, given um, the prospect of oceanic ecological collapse. There are. I mean, so again, it depends on where you draw the boundary for um, what you're considering as a tool for extinction. As we talked about in the case of the ferret and the northern white, white rhino, we're applying some of these tools that species have, uh, for species that have not yet gone extinct. So there are a host, as I mentioned, of species that are on the threshold um, of extinction in the ocean. People probably heard, for example, the vaquita, um, perhaps the first marine mammal to go extinct. Um, some people have talked about potentially applying genetic engineering tools or applying the extinction tools to that case study. The challenge um, with a lot with the vaquita and a lot of um, 
of uh, marine species is that the methods become even more intractable when you take them to aquatic species. Think about the kinds of things, the interventions and the science we can do with a northern right rhino, which stays put, is on land. You don't have to ventilate, or at least you don't have to um, um, uh, ventilate in the same way you would have to work with in a complex way in marine mammal. Um, all of those tools are a little bit further behind um, in those technologies when it comes to marine mammals or aquatic animals. So by, by and large, most of the species that people have been talking about for de-extinction are terrestrial, um, and there's a host of them. There's a bunch, by not, no surprise, we talked about the charisma and how that drives uh, targets for extinction. Most of the animals people talk about are birds and mammals. Um, a small number of plants in the mix, but uh, a small fraction of those that are being discussed seriously and none that are being actively included, at least that I know, um, beyond the conversation stage um, are marine. Thank you. So someone is um, asking about the stick rat that you kind of sort of ended with the, that example. So they're wondering what caused the stick rat to go extinct. And um, this kind of ties into what you were talking about, about the different factors of whether or not you should or should not de-extinct something. Um, has the threat that caused them to go extinct been removed or reduced to the extent that a de-extinction effort would be successful? That's a really good question. And you know, I am not recalling actually what the agent was for driving the stick rat extinct, but that is exactly the kind of strategic thinking that you'd want to apply. So um, you'd want to know if it was a virus, if it was habitat loss, or if it was um, some other kind of driver before you were to bring it back. It's been a while since I was writing and thinking about stick rats. And so I'll have to jump back and remind my own self what it was in the Australian desert that had driven the stink rat extinct in the first place. Um, but you would absolutely want a good answer to that question um, before you actually elevated a stick rat for a, for, for a candidate for de-extinction. I was hoping in the stick rat question, this would be the first donor that stepped forward to move forward with stick, stick rat de-extinction. But um, Unfortunately, this person um, asked their question anonymously, so I can't call them out right now and suggest that maybe they think <laughs> about starting a campaign to bring back the stick rat. Um, so one of our uh, museum volunteers has actually asked a question. All of these new methods produce just a few individuals. How do you create the necessary diversity within a population to maintain a healthy species? Right. Well, that's a really good question. So. Um, a real important challenge, and, and again, this classical playbook of conservation is dealing with genetic bottlenecks, which means that when you lose a bunch of species, when you're down to four rhinos, um, you're down to a very small gene pool. And then if you build back up successfully from that small gene pool, consider the case of the sea otter, um, built back up at least in the California coast from um, several dozen individuals, or the case of the northern elephant seal, similar, very small population built back up to a much larger population successfully because of conservation, but there are real genetic implications because that gene pool was so small. Um, you can think of all of the complications that come from inbreeding and, and low genetic diversity. So how do you um, deal with some of that um, in de-extinction? Well, depending on which tool you use, um, if you have access to a bunch of different germ lines, if you have access to, for example, you know, if you're doing IVF and you have frozen in zoos, bunches of different sperm from lots of animals and zoos do a pretty good job of curating these frozen libraries and purposely curating diversity in those frozen tissue libraries, then you have one way to address that issue. Another potential way to address that issue, of course, if you're doing genetic engineering is that you are uh, behind the steering wheel. So you can engineer some diversity back into those populations. Of course, you can just begin to imagine the hazard that comes from trying to do that correctly. Um, a whole new um, can of worms that you're opening in terms of genetic hazards when you when you make those kinds of attempts. Perfect. So we're kind of out of time, but I just want to um, go off of what you were just saying and remind people that our last ideas on tap um, during the first week of February was about the condor pre the California condor breeding program um, that's run out of the Oregon Zoo and. Um, that presenter did spend a little bit of time talking about how they manage genetic diversity among the California condors um, in their conservation breeding program. So if anyone's missed that and is interested in going back to learn a little bit more about that, you can find it on our YouTube page.
So thank you again so much, Doug, for joining us this evening and for everyone out there watching who attended. I really appreciate it. And I hope everyone has a great evening. Thanks.